scripture reading for Brother Kevin Glesson will be from Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 15. Romans 10, 14 and 15. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear him without a preacher? <clears throat> how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Appreciate again the continual invitation to come back. Uh, every time I go back home, the elder of the congregation, they say, well, how'd it go at Gaston? And I say, well, they didn't kick me out, they didn't stop the sermon, and they invited me back next time. So, positive, all right? So, it is good. I do, again, appreciate always being able to be here. I uh, want to also say thank you to Trace for the songs. Uh, really do pair well with the thoughts that I like to bring to the table this morning. Uh, here am I, send me. Uh, it's a really great, great song. And to think about what that means is to imply to God that here I am, to do your purpose, to do your will. And, and purpose and will in God is not just obviously working out my own salvation with fear and trembling and get Kevin to heaven, but it's also to see the need and recognizing what that need is, but also feed that need. And that's kind of the topic and the, and the title that I want us to think about this morning is Feed the Need. Now, in order to really be able to feed something, we have to recognize what is it we're, we're feeding, right? Uh, there's a need out there in the world, and we're going to feed that need. Uh, on the way here, just before we even got on the interstate, I think we've seen four people standing on a corner asking for money. And the first thing that you think of is, well, you're going to feed the need. What is the need? Well, the need for them is money. How are we going to feed that need? We're going to give them money. Is both of those the right answer? The reality is we're trying to feed them that which they're asking for. And so we easily do so, or we don't. We may just pass by them and, and discriminate or wonder why they're there. And, and we question them to say there's... There's job signs everywhere. Why are you on the corner? Why don't you not be lazy and go work? Or we may stop for just a moment and give them some small token of money and wish them well. Did either one of those answers feed the need? And I will encourage you to say the answer is no. Because, again, our failure sometimes and our challenge is that we don't recognize what their true need really is. So... When we come back to feed that need, we use the wrong feed to be able to help them. What do they really need? Is it something physical? Because in their eyes, they're needing something today, right now, the immediate. But is that our objective as Christians? To feed them something today, something that's not going to last, it's going to perish, it's not going to value them in any capacity, getting them to heaven. And so again, our feed that we use is again money out of our pocket because we think the need is the money. When the reality is the need is not the money, so therefore the feed should be reality is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now they don't know that. That's half their battle. Because in their mind they need the money for now for whatever cause they say it is or whatever real truth it is. Either it's food, drugs, alcohol, whatever it is. But what really should our MO be? What, what should be our main objective for them? Have you ever been in a situation that you thought you had it all figured out? That you said the real need of today is to make money, go work hard, and put food on the table. And, and there's some truth to that. But when you wake up every day, what's the greatest need that you have? It's truly to live for Christ, to draw closer to Christ, because it ultimately... We're wanting to go to heaven. Secondary to that is that we do go out and we work, we put some food on the table, we take care of our family. If we have those flip-flop, we forgot again the necessity of the need of some spiritual nature. 
And again, someone on the corner may not recognize the fact is that their greater need has nothing to do with money. And yet it has everything to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ to save their souls. Well, first of all, to turn from the errors of their ways, to save their souls and get them to heaven. And I'm afraid, again, that we're so challenged to think that, well, we're feeding the wrong need or we're using the wrong feed for the wrong need. Now, again, that's an example of people who are standing on the corner holding a sign asking for money. What about people in your family? What about your spouse? What about your kids? Your aunts and uncles, your parents, whoever they are. What about your co-workers? What about your church members? Are we feeding their need? Why are you here this morning? For what need are you here this morning? Is it just because, well, that's when the elders say we're going to open up the doors and you're going to be here, right? Well, what about those of you who don't come back at Sunday evening? What about those who don't come back on Wednesdays? For what purpose are they coming back if they are coming back? And for what reason are they not coming back if they don't? And I want you to ask yourselves that question. If you come back Sunday night and Wednesdays, why do you come back? If you choose not to come back Sunday evenings or Wednesdays at all, why don't you? Now, I want you to think about that this day and then also consider that as we go through this lesson of either one of those answers. Why are you here? For what purpose? Now, I'm going to throw that back on Kevin this morning and I'm going to answer this for you later on at the end of this lesson. Why is Kevin here this morning? And I have to answer that. And I will. Before I do so, and before you answer to yourselves, I want us to consider some text here. In John chapter 6, this is a little lengthy, but I'm going to break it up. But you'll see the reason why I, I want to bring this to the table this morning. In John chapter 6, beginning, in, beginning here in verse 1, I'm going to go 1 through 14. He says, After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. A large crowd followed him, because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. So again, here's a feed, here's a need that these people thought they had. Then Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. So here's a reason why they gathered. Therefore Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so, the, so that these may eat? So again, there's a large gathering for a reason. The Passover, not just the disciples, but all these people coming. They heard, this man is great, he heals the sick, so we're going to go to him for something, period. But notice what it is. They're first going to Jesus because they hear that he's healing sick. So again, there's a physical need, but there's something bigger about Jesus. More so in the spiritual realm, a divine realm. In verse 6, this he was saying to test him. Again, go, let me read verse 5 again. Therefore Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Philip said to him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these for so many people? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number of about 5,000. Jesus took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated, likewise also of the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up. And filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, Truly, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. This, this verse 14 is going to be very important as we go forward. Again, they came to Jesus because he was healing the sick. They had no idea that Jesus was going to perform this major miracle. Five thousand people. We know the story, right? He's going to take the bread and the fish. He's going to give it to them as much as they wanted. Beyond fulfillment. They're going to gather all the extras up. Okay? Jesus is doing something here. Something amazing. And we can find really good examples by this on how we're going to feed the need of other people. What Jesus is going to do is to help them realize 
where their true need really is. And it has nothing to do with physical food. Now, up to this moment, we have no context that tells us that Jesus has said anything at all to these people. We're not told that he has stood up and proclaimed the gospel to these people. All that we're told is that these people are flocking to Jesus because they think, in verse 14 it says here, they think he's this prophet who is to come into the world. Okay, This prophet, they may have other prophecies that declare, obviously, the Messiah, a great prophet's coming. But again, we're told later on that when Jesus asked Philip, who do people say that I am? Well, Jeremiah or Elijah are just a great prophet. They're not recognizing Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus knows that they recognize him as this great man, this great prophet. But what Jesus is going to illustrate to them that he's also greater than that. He truly is the Messiah who is to come in the world and who is going to be the one that's going to forgive them of their sins. But he has to make sure that these people first recognize the error of what their need truly is. Because again, the reason why they're seeking Jesus is completely wrong. And I'm afraid in churches today, the reason why people are seeking Jesus is completely wrong. Again, I go back to the question, why are you here this morning? Why do you come on Sunday mornings? Why do you come on Sunday nights or Wednesdays or vice versa? Why don't you? Because I think we're so misunderstood about what my need really is. I either have a need to come back or I have a need not to come back. I see the, the reason why I should or I don't see the reason why I shouldn't. But what Jesus is going to do here to them and even to us is illustrate there is a great need. And the challenge is, is that we're so confused sometimes about what the true need really is. In verse 15, he says, So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. Now, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. And after getting into a boat, they started to cross the sea to Capernaum. It had already become dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea began to be stirred up because of a strong wind was blowing. Then when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. So they were willing to receive him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. The next day, the crowd that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no small boat there except one, and that Jesus has not entered with the disciples into the boat, but that his disciples had gone away alone. There came other small boats from Tiberias near to the place uh, where they ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the small boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Now I want to stop there in verse 25. You remember what the word rabbi means? Teacher. So again, they wanted to seize Jesus to make him king. Again, not king, true king of the Jews, not true king of, of the earth and all things in it, as in God. But a lowercase k, they want to make their little earthly king. Because he done these wonderful things. We see in the context here that they went to seek for Jesus. Jesus is no longer there. His disciples were no longer there. Where'd they go? We want to find this guy. He just filled our bellies so much. We want to go find this man. We want to make him a king. He's no longer here. But then in verse 25, they illustrate here, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said, Rabbi. It wasn't so much that really the question of here is, when did you get here? It's more so as they recognize him as as a teacher, as someone who is teaching them something. But amazingly, again, I go back to the statement, is we're not ever told that Jesus ever taught them anything. In this context, at least. But they're recognizing Jesus as someone great, again, someone who is illustrating something to them. In verse 26, Jesus answered them, says, Truly, truly, truly I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Again, I ask the question, why are you here this morning? Why do you come to church? If you go to another congregation, uh, even of a Church of Christ denomination, or if you go to another denomination and you ask them, why are you here? What has drawn you into the building this day? Somebody might say, well, it's the name of the building. 
Somebody might say, what's the size of the building? It looks like a really good sized congregation. Those people must be right, so we're going to go there. Uh, Some people like small churches. Uh, Some people like the fact that that church has a huge basketball facility on the side of it. I've heard you got really great youth programs. I hear you do missionary trips. I hear you you do all these things. You're part of a school system of some nature. So that's why we want to go there. My my friends that that go to work with me every single day, they go to there and they say, this is really, really great. We have all these Christmas programs and these Easter programs and everything else. You got to come here. It's like a rock concert every Sunday morning. What did Jesus say here in this context? Verse 26, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. What was it about this statement that Jesus is illustrating to them their initial need? Jesus isn't telling them that you came to me because you have some spiritual need. He says, you seek me because you ate something and you were filled. In other words, you came to me and you got something from me. Something that you needed. And then when you got it, you were completely filled up. Now again, the source of that, or whatever it was, the bread and fish, was not the true fulfillment that Jesus is talking about. What he's illustrating them, you came to me not because of a sign. That which again in verse 14 And even in the beginning of the chapter, that's why they came to see him initially, right? Jesus was healing the sick. In verse 14, Jesus gave a sign of the fish and the loaves. But what Jesus is illustrating to them again is, why did you come to me? Initially, sick, healing. But no, why did you come to me? What did you get? You got a fulfillment of something from only me, and I was the only one who could do that for you. Right behind that, why did you come and find me again? Because again, you wanted the loaves and you wanted the fish again. No, you wanted the fulfillment that only that I can give. And what Jesus was trying to do is to get them to recognize that. You didn't come to me just for some fish and some loaves. You came to me for something more. In addition to that, you want to make me a king, but you sought me as a prophet. You know there's something greater about me. And his point is this. Let me show you what that is. You came here today because the doors were open. You came here because the elders said this is the time to meet. No, you came here because Jesus Christ offers you something that you can't get anywhere else. That's why you're here. The reason why you're here has nothing to do with the fact is that this is the time it is. Has nothing to do with the fact because you like to sing and you're going to sing a song while you're here. Has nothing to do with the fact that you like to pray has everything to do with what Jesus Christ provides for you, and that is His Word, sustainment, fulfillment, and eternal life. And you can't get that anywhere else. In addition to that, the extra bonus of that is that you have His children, brothers and sisters in Christ, here with you to encourage you with one another and build up one another to get you together to overcome sin and challenges in life and pray for you so that you together get to go to heaven together. And Jesus Christ created that too. In verse 27, actually let me read verse 26. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father God has sent his seal. Therefore they said to him, What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Now I'm going to stop right there because you would think that Jesus' next answer would be, What? (laughs) You want another sign? I just gave you one. You just came from the fact that you heard miracles of healing the sick. You came after me. I gave you this fulfillment. Then you want to know how did you get to the other side of the boat? Because his boat was over here. When did you get here? How did you get here? Oh, by the way, you didn't know, but I walked on water. But anyhow, you came after me for more miracles. You came for me for more signs. So again, what sign do you do? That we may believe that we may do the works of God. Well, again, Jesus said the works of God is this. Not that you can go out and make bread and fish duplicate. 
The work of God is this, and it's plain, and it's simple, and it's form. Believe. That's it. It's, again, as simple as that. Believe in Jesus Christ, who He is and what He is. What He has done and what He will do for you. And again, it's as simple as that. In verse 31, our fathers ate the man in the wilderness. So here's their sign, right? Here's the sign that they're asking Jesus to do. And if you can't do a sign, but here, I'll give you some historical reference. Here's a sign that happened in the past. And so we're going to ask for a very similar sign. Again, you just did it, but we're going to ask for another one. Our fathers ate the man in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world, meaning Jesus, and his way and his gospel. In verse 34, then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. <laughs> the bread's standing right in front of you and they don't know it. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Now that's an amazing statement. What did Jesus do to them? Again, feed the need. To be able to feed the need, we have to recognize what the need is first. And then when you recognize it, you know then what you need to feed that. Because again, if we're, we think the need is to give somebody something earthly, something that perishes, something that's physical, something that's ter ter temporary, then we're going to go back and find an earthly, physical, perishable, temporary item to feed that. But when the need is spiritual and it's eternal, then we go back to the ultimately the spiritual, long-lasting, unperishable, amazing truly powerful gospel that saves their life, and that is Jesus Christ. And that's the source that people need to recognize. One of our challenges, again, is sometimes this. And I'm guilty of it, so when I say this, I always include me. Kevin, I see that people have a need, but I just don't want to be a part of that need. That need is too great, it's too complicated, and I just don't have the time. I just don't have the energy. Those people, they're just messed up. they got a long way to go. Or we say, you know what, they're just too far along and they're never going to change. I can go over here and I have, I have a hope with this person. You also might say, you know what, I fed the need to somebody and I fed them the gospel every day of their life. And I keep trying and I keep trying and I keep trying and they're just not listening. Well, don't give up on them. Jesus didn't give up on you. Why should we give up on them? I mean, there was somebody probably in your life that didn't give up on you. I mean, were we perfect? No. Have, did we have a need at some point in our life before we came to Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Did somebody come after us and get us to, to understand the gospel, to believe in that gospel, partake of that gospel? And now that you're filled, is that it? No, we take our fulfillment, we rejoice of our fulfillment, and we go out there and say, you need this too. But again, one of the challenges is that if you don't recognize where you got your fulfillment, that you do have the fulfillment and that you are filled and the joy that that is, how is it then that we turn around to somebody else and say, look, you need this too. And it's the most amazing thing that will ever happen to your life. And then the other side of that coin, we say, well, I just don't know how to do that. Good. Open this up. Start reading from it. Jesus will do it right for you. You have nothing to do. You don't have to stand up here and wave your arms like I do all the time and and, and start screaming at people. All you got to do is open it up and read it to them. Help them understand what it says just a little bit. Let God do all the work. God says, you know what? Plant the seed and water it. And let me do everything else. But if we're not feeding them the right thing, if we don't recognize the true need, then we may never ever take this, the true source, the true bread of life, and hand it to them and help them to see it and understand and partake of it. When in reality is, I'd rather just go give them 20 bucks and go on. Or I'd rather ignore them who they are, just pass by and judge them and discriminate against them for the rest of their lives. Jesus saw a need and he went after it and he fed it. He illustrated to them it wasn't the bread that you needed. It was the fulfillment of that which only he could give. And it wasn't earthly, it wasn't physical, it was spiritual. 
In verse 36, but I said to you, I said to you that those that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. Again, it's Jesus' choice. They had no idea at this moment that Jesus was talking about raising up his line for us. But in order for us to truly be fulfilled, in order for us to have this in our hands 2,000 years later, Jesus Christ had to die. It's amazing that 2,000 years ago, Jesus saw the fact is that you need Him. That you need His everlasting word of life. To be truly fulfilled to get you to heaven. And Jesus saw that need then and died for you today. And verse 38, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. The need is this, folks, that Jesus Christ is the answer. And that every one of us needs Jesus Christ. Now, all of you are sitting here this morning and looking at me and going, Duh. <laughs> we get it. We know this. Hello. But do you? Because I go back and ask, the Why are you here this morning? Why do you come back Sunday evenings? And why do you come back Wednesday evenings? Or why don't you come back Sunday evenings? And why don't you come back Wednesday evenings? How many people do you know in your life that are Christians and follow Jesus Christ? Conversely, how many people do you know in your life that don't? And that are not Christians and they don't follow Jesus Christ. When Jesus encouraged us to go out to all the world, preach the gospel and save people, baptize them in his name. In reality, that mission is right in front of our faces. I have family members that are not Christians, absolutely. I see an immediate need right then and there, right in front of my face. I don't need to go to China or India or somewhere else and go preach the gospel. If someone else wants to do that, I praise them for that, and I really hope they do that. I hope the gospel spreads all the way around the world. But my need is right in front of my face. I work with 200 and something people at my job. That's 200 people. Now, out of those 200 people, how many people are Christians? I could point them out because I know those people. I'm not going to say that they're from Church of Christ or whatever, but at least they have a chance. They believe in God in some measure. How many neighbors do you have? How many friends? How many people do you have on social media? How many people do you follow or follow you on Facebook or Instagram? Or whatever social media you use. How many people are in your life to such a capacity that you have the ability to feed the need of Jesus Christ? Now here's the tougher answer. How many of those people have you ever reached out to and tried to help spiritually? That's a tough answer. There's a movie with Kevin Costner. He was a Coast Guard member. I'm sure you guys watched this movie or heard the story before. I think it's called The Guardian. Maybe I'm wrong. Gene, Gene knows. He's a movie guy. But what struck me in that movie was towards the end when Ashton Kutcher asked Kevin Costner how many people he had saved. Coast Guard, I think he said around five or six or whatever. And Ashton was thrown back. It's like, that's it? That's really it? Because Ashton wanted to break every record that Kevin had ever set as far as all the swimming records and diving records and you name it. And, and Ashton did it. He got them all. He's amazing. It's wonderful. You got all the records. So what? And at the end of the movie, he asked him, how many people did you say? And I'll just say the word was five. And he's like, what five? And he kept asking him about that number. And finally, Kevin replied to him that I think it was five people that he had lost. He never counted how many people he saved. That number didn't matter to him. 
What mattered to him was how many people he lost. The movie Schindler's List was very much similar. That towards the end of the movie, Oscar Schindler was devastated. Out of the millions of Jews that he was able to help save and pull from the concentration camps, what hurt him the most was not how many people he was able to save. But at the end, he was wondering how many more people he could have saved by selling his fancy car. He took the ring off of his hand and wondered how many more Jews' life he could have saved by selling that piece. That's what mattered to him. It's not about how many people you've saved. It's about how many people we've lost. How many more people could we have helped in the moment, but we chose to pass by, we chose to keep going, we try, chose to ignore those things. Because maybe in reality, we didn't want to get ourselves engrossed in their chaos and their challenges. And we may not know how to get in those things. Or we've tried a couple times and they just don't want to listen to us. We'll try again. Jesus didn't give up on us. And he's not giving up on them. And you know what? In reality, there, there may never be a day that they'll ever listen to you. But I want to know when my life is over that I tried. Not so much that I can say, God, well, I tried, I did my best, right? As in a prideful thing, but out of humility, I tried. I still think about my parents every single day, and my brother, who I thought I could have tried just a little bit more. I could have said one more thing. I could have answered one more phone call. I could have tried to call them one more time to help them change their minds and change their ways of life. In some capacity, I still regret and hope that maybe in some way I could have said something and done something more. Regardless of all the energy that I did expend to try to do that. But notice what Jesus says here in verse 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise Him up on the last day. What Jesus does is He makes it as, again, as simple as that. Believe. If we can just take the gospel of Jesus Christ to those people and just get them to believe what Jesus has done for them, what Jesus will do for them, how difficult is it for us to take a time out for just a moment in our lives? And I'm not, I'm, no, I'm stepping on toes this morning, but I'm stepping on my own. And just read them the gospel and let Jesus do all the work. Let Jesus come here. Let Jesus die for the sins. Let Jesus rise up again. Let Jesus' power be manifested. Let Jesus do it all. Because that's what Jesus said He is. And He's doing it. He's done it all. He's doing it all. All He needs you to do is feed the need. Well, what does that mean? Show up and preach the gospel. And I'm not just talking about showing up in church. Which that's absolutely what you should do. Show up to people's lives. Show up to people's occasions. And when you do, it's not always about sports. It's not always about their chaos. It's not always about the news and the political stuff that you can't change. It's about their eternal life because you love them and you care. That's the thing that you can change. And the way that you change it is you fillet open that Bible and you read Jesus to them and you proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you do that in unison of you walking faithfully yourselves. Because you truly are the walking light for them. And so what do they do? They do the same thing they did to Jesus. They follow you. They don't follow you because of you. They follow your way of life, your standard. I don't put myself up on a pedestal, but we've interviewed several guys for new positions at our jobs, and they say, what management style do you think you want to have? What management style are you going to bring to our company? And they point at me and they say his. I don't take that as an arrogant thing. I take that for an honor. The fact is that I must be doing something right. I'm illustrating something. I'm showing something to those people. And who do they want to mock and imitate and follow after? It's me. It's about how I treat people. It's about how I respond to those people and take care of those people. And that, that meant, felt me really good. But I was like, okay, well, I got you. Now I got to go to the next guy. And that's the mission. It's not about standing prideful and, and taking that praise and say, look at me. It's saying, okay, I've got this one. Let's go on to the next one now. I'm going to bring this to a close. 
Therefore the Jews were grumbling at him because he said, I am the bread of life that came down out of heaven. And they were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father or mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets and there shall be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which also I give will give for the life of the world is my flesh. I'm going to read verse 51 one more time there. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. Out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of this world is my flesh. Now obviously they go on to grumble about eating his flesh. They miss the whole point. What is Jesus ultimately illustrating to them in the end? I am this bread. Jesus, again, they misunderstood. We're going to eat your flesh. We're going to drink your blood. Well, yeah, we're here in a moment. We're going to do that. But we do that in, again, a faith of what it represents. And what that represents is the fulfillment of eternal life. When Jesus Christ looks at us initially... We are sinners who are completely empty and have nothing. But when he died for our sins, he gave us the ability to take the nothing and the less and make it fulfilled and purposeful. It's up to us to receive that. You know, when my wife makes dinner, she doesn't need to come and tell me, get in here and eat. After she already told me the food was ready. Right? When they say dinner's ready... She will not find Kevin still sitting on the couch doing whatever Kevin's doing. Kevin will have already been in the kitchen 10 minutes ago asking, when is it going to be ready? Because it smells so good, let's go. So the point is this. We don't wait one day to all of a sudden realize it's ready. It's the anticipation of going to God, when is it coming? I'm ready. Let us annoy the snot out of God and say, when are you coming? And I'm ready. The anticipation is real. I can feel it. I can sense it. I can smell it. I can't wait for it. Why is that? Because the desire there, the hunger is there. We know that he is ultimately the source of the most fulfillment that you've ever had. And it has nothing to do with fried chicken and mashed potatoes. He's going to give you everything that he is. And the neat thing about that is the most amazing thing is that God has looked at us from dust to sin, and he has looked at us with love. And when he has done that, he has allowed his son to die for our sins, to forgive us of our sins, and then give us his greatest fulfillment, and that is eternal life, which again, we don't deserve. Now again, our mission is once we have that, we go out in the world and we tell those people that Jesus Christ is the bread of life. Go receive him, believe on him and follow him and he'll give you everything that you need. The challenge that we have is this. that so many people say, well, I'm already fulfilled. By what? Physical food, wealth. Drugs, alcohol, love, earthly love, whatever it is, they think their life is perfect. They think their life is good. They think their life is fulfilled and sustained. Even the richest guy in the world is trying to make more money because he's not happy. He's trying to buy the next biggest thing because, again, he's not happy. The fulfillment is not here. If it's in wealth, if it's in money, it will burn, it will fail, and you'll be disappointed. If it's an earthly love of someone, again, it will fail, it will end in, in this fact. The fact is this, that we're all human, right? That every one of us has a disagreement or an argument of something or whatever. Even though our love is there, my point is this, no one can love you in the way that God loves you. 
Because His love is truly the most amazing love because He is love. And again, one day, whoever you're married to will end just because you both will perish, you both will die. Again, non-sustainable. I know that sounds negative, but it's just our lives are not meant to last forever. Earthly. Physically. But the marriage relationship with Jesus Christ, as the church is the bride and He's the groom, is everlasting. His fulfillment is everlasting. The riches of heaven are everlasting. And He has made that way possible to you. Now in closing, I promised you that I would give you an answer. Why am I here? Well, hopefully, the last 40 minutes have told you that answer. Why am I here? Because when I say this, I really mean this. I truly love you all. And I have tasted the good gift of Jesus Christ and the blessings of what he offers us. And I so very much, so very much want you to have that too. I can never express it. The reason why I stand up here is not because I want to give you a presentation. The Lord knows it's not because I like to hear myself speak. But I truly, when I say this, I love you guys. And I really, really, really want you to go to heaven. There's no more important thing in your life that matters at this moment right now other than you receiving Jesus Christ and going to heaven. Nothing. And if I could pour out my heart and if I could plead to you guys in such a capacity, in such a way for you to recognize Jesus as the true fulfillment and receive him and you'll get eternal life, that's the most amazing accomplishment I could ever, ever achieve in my life. But I will tell you this. I'll never ever take in consideration or account of how many people I've ever reached and how many people I've ever helped. What matters to me is how many people didn't. How many people refused and how many people ignored and chose not to. That's what matters to me. As a minister and as a preacher and every other man has ever stood up here and talked, we have no idea sometimes if this word ever pricked your heart. Sometimes we have no idea if it ever changed your life. But again, what has God called me and every other man to stand up here and do? Preach it. Plant the seed, water it, and let God do the growth. And folks, you may not be someone that can stand up here and do just that. But there's someone in your life that you can go and you can reach and you can do just that. Read it to them. Teach it to them. And help them. Because the alternative, if we don't receive Jesus, and the alternative, if we don't change their lives, is the most dreadful and unthinkable thing that could ever happen to someone for all eternity. But taking a moment to consider your lives, and taking a moment to read the gospel, and taking a moment to believe on Him, and getting other people to read it and believe on Him, the outpouring, the fulfillment, is beyond anything we could ever imagine. Is the most glorious and hopeful thing that we cannot, absolutely cannot wait to go receive and enjoy for all eternity. And the reason why I know that, the reason why I know that, is because the Son of God came down here, set aside His crown, and He died for you. And if heaven ain't worth that, the sacrifice and the beatings that He went through, we misunderstood of how valuable heaven really is to God and how much He truly loves us. He does. I stand here this morning and I say how much I love you. God's love is so much greater than any love that I could ever give you guys. And again, His Son has proven that. So again, I encourage you and I implore you and beg you to give your life to Christ. To turn your life around. To go out there and spread that gospel and save souls. Feed the need. If that is for you this morning, if we can help in any way, may come forward now as we stand and sing.